1 Samuel chapter 23, if you have your Bible, and we will begin at verse number 1. Then they told David, saying, Behold, the Philistines fight against Keilah, and they rob the threshing floors. Therefore David inquired of the Lord, saying, Shall I go and smite these Philistines? And the Lord said unto David, Go and smite the Philistines and save Keilah. And David's men said unto him, Behold, We be afraid here in Judah, how much more then if we come to Keilah against the armies of the Philistines? Then David inquired of the Lord yet again, and the Lord answered him and said, Arise, go down to Keilah, for I will deliver the Philistines into thine hand. So David and his men went to Keilah and fought with the Philistines and brought away their cattle and smote them with a great slaughter. So David saved the inhabitants of Keilah. And it came to pass when Abiathar, the son of Ahimelech, fled to David to Keilah, that he came down with an ephod in his hand. And it was told Saul that David was come to Keilah. And Saul said, God hath delivered him into mine hand, for he is shut in, By entering into a town that hath gates and bars. And Saul called all the people together to war to go down to Keilah to besiege David and his men. And David knew that Saul secretly practiced mischief against him. And he said to Abiathar the priest, Bring hither the ephod. Then said David, O Lord God of Israel, thy servant hath certainly heard that Saul seeketh to come to Keilah to destroy the city for my sake. Will the men of Keilah deliver me up into his hand? Will Saul come down as thy servant hath heard? O Lord God of Israel, I beseech thee, tell thy servant. And the Lord said, he will come down. Then said David, will the men of Keilah deliver me and my men into the hand of Saul? And the Lord said, they will deliver thee up. Then David and his men, which were about 600, arose and departed out of Keilah and went whithersoever they could go. And it was told Saul that David was escaped from Keilah and he forbear to go forth. We'll end our reading there at verse number 13. There is something that we are all very familiar with, and it is uh, seeing two pictures or drawings that are set side by side, and we are invited to spot the difference. We're invited to observe the two and to try to tell where the differences lie. And sometimes when it is a spot the difference on the back of a box of cereal or something, it is really quite easy. You can see the differences at a quick glance, and at other times you really have to scrutinize. It can be difficult to spot the differences. They are very, very subtle, and you can't see them. You might even have to look at the bottom of the box uh, to find the answer, uh, to see exactly where the differences are. And in this book of First Samuel, there is no doubt that in inspiring it, God has put before us these two first kings of Israel. We have Saul and we have David. And while at the beginnings of their ministries or their roles as in, in, the, in the passages that we've read, the differences between them might appear rather subtle, the farther into this book that we get, the more glaring and obvious the differences are. And we noticed this when we were in chapter 23, how Saul was somebody who was a master of shifting the blame. 
And therefore, we never really find Saul repenting up to this point. And yet when David is, is, has sinned and, and the, the, the conviction is brought, David holds up his hands and acknowledges his wrongdoing. And now in getting into this chapter 23, we see the same thing happening again, where we see the the difference between King Saul and King David becomes very obvious. And we see how this plays out here at the beginning of the chapter. If you have your Bible there, you'll see the, the scenario that unfolds. It says, then they told David, saying, behold, the Philistines fight against Keila and they rob the threshing floors. Keila was a, a city in Israel, but it lay near the border where the Philistines were. And therefore Keila was a somewhat isolated city and it was very, very vulnerable to a Philistine attack. All the Philistines had to do was cross a little ways over the border and there was Keila, really a sitting duck for them to attack. And here the Philistines have attacked Keila during the harvest when the people are busy threshing the crops that they have lovingly planted and tended to and harvested and are now busy threshing. The Philistines have invaded them, stealing the harvest and overwhelming the people. And David is made aware of what is happening here in this city. Something we might say has landed on David's table. Uh, something that he now has to process, uh, something that he has to think about. Uh, How is David to react to what he has heard? There's new information put before him and, and David has to respond and he has to think and he has to process and, and react in some way. And how does David know how to respond? Is this merely a case where David has to get the cogs in his own mind turning and he has to process everything that that, that he encounters with his own logic and with his own wisdom? Well, by no means. The answer to this question of how David responds to the things that he hears or to the events that are happening around them, the the, the importance of, of observing this in David's life is hard for us to overstate. David is is giving us an example here as the people of God of how we are to negotiate when we hear things or in deciding how to react. And the first thing we notice here is that David seeks God's word. David seeks God's word. Really, this is one half, we might say, of the very dominant point that these verses are making. David is repeatedly, he is consistently seeking a word from God. David is constantly wanting to know the mind of God. David has had something put on his table, he needs to think about it, he needs to respond to it, and and David isn't engaging with this with the cogs of his mind alone. David's concern is, what does God say about this thing? What is the mind of God about this? Because that's what he wants. Now observe how obviously this is a key point in this passage. If you have your Bible, look at what it says in verse 2. David hears about this in verse 1. Therefore, David inquired of the Lord, saying, Shall I go and smite these Philistines? Look at what it says in verse 4. Then David inquired of the Lord yet again. Look at what it says in verse 10. Then said David, O Lord God of Israel. And then it says in verse 11 when he's talking to God, Will the men of Keilah deliver me up into his hand? Will Saul come down as thy servant hath heard? O Lord God of Israel, I beseech thee, tell thy servant. Verse 12, then said David again to the Lord, will the men of Keilah deliver me and my men into the hand of Saul? So repeatedly and consistently, David's preoccupation here is to know God's thinking. David wants the mind of God regarding this scenario that is before him. You will observe that David's concern is not, what would would I think I should do? 
David's concern is not, what would I prefer to do? David's concern is not, what would be easier for me to do? David's concern is not, what are other people doing about Keila? David's concern is not, why isn't Saul, who is the functioning king, doing something about Keila? No, none of those things are on David's mind. David's mind is, I've got something on the table that I need to think about, I need to process, I need to respond to, what am I going to do? My concern is, what does God have to say to me about this? And in his example here, David is serving as an example to us all. He he is very much like the Bereans in the New Testament who who were willing to say, I don't even really, my primary concern is not what does the preacher say, my concern is what does God say? That was their concern. They went home and they opened the Bible and they wanted to say, was the preacher right in what he said? Does it align with the word? Is it, is it a fair and a faithful interpretation? That was what the Bereans did. And here is David as a wonderful example. David's concern is, what does the word say? Now, it is very easy for us, especially as good Protestant people, to, to have this mantra that we are people of the word. Very easy for us to, to say we are people of, 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 of who believe in the word alone is our ultimate, it is our final authority on all things pertaining to life and godliness, but it's, it's easier for it to be a mantra than for it to be a reality that, that where the rubber meets the road, David here gives us a godly example. God, I'm going to inquire of your word, what do you say? So David's first reaction here is he seeks the word of God. It's the word that he really wants to hear. Not only does he seek the word, but he savors the word. And and this is, I think this is beautiful. When David asks if he should go to Keilah, look at the answer that he gets at the end of verse 2. God says, the word of God is go and smite the Philistines and save Keilah. Now, I think that you would all agree that this is a difficult word from God. Can you imagine you're David, and now you've got to go to Keilah. It is this vulnerable border city, very near the Philistine and the Philistine territory. Their army is this incredible war machine, and this is a hard word. It's like one of those moments when you say, I've got a scenario, God, and and I want to hear what you say, and I'm going to go to the Word, and we're going to go to study the Word, and I don't know if this happens to you, child of God, it still happens to me, where sometimes you get the answer, and, and the implications kind of wash over you, and you say, this is hard. This is, I want to do the will of God and and I've got the answer to my question, but the implications kind of wash over you and you say, this is hard. And this was hard, the word of God for David. Look at what it says in verse three. David's men actually said unto him, we be afraid here in Judah, how much more then if we come to Keilah against the army of the Philistines? David's men say, we're scared enough where we are, David, but but to go to Keilah, to go near the border where where the Philistines have already invaded and and, and they've got reinforcements just over the border, uh, we're afraid. This is a hard word for us to obey. So what does David do? Well, we could put it like this. David, and and this, this is really important, David digs deeper, if you like, into the word. Or, 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 or David goes back to God and, and he asks God again. And look at God's answer this time in verse 4. David inquired of the Lord yet again. And the Lord answered him and said, Arise, go down to Keilah, for I will deliver the Philistines into thine hand. The difficult command is repeated. Arise and go to Keilah. The word of God hasn't changed, it hasn't softened, it hasn't lessened, it is the same. Go to Keilah. But the difficult command comes with a corresponding promise. I will deliver the Philistines into thine hand. So as David is is engaging with the word here and he finds it hard, he he then is granted this, this additional promise. And in the light of the promise, the difficulty of the command begins to melt away. 
God is saying, do something hard, but, but while you go to Keilah, I will be granting you the grace, and I will be granting you the strength, and I will be responsible for delivering the Philistines into your hand. So all of a sudden, David, in his seeking of the word, he's come up with a hard command. There's no disputing there, but he's come up with a promise that he is able to savor. He has come up with something here to rejoice his heart. Here is something now that, that David can meditate on. Here is a promise that he can taste and all the way to Keilah with all of the thoughts bombarding his heart. Keilah, the Philistines, we're close to the border. He has got something to savor, something to rejoice in, something to delight. The command is there, but the promise shining a light on the command is of enablement. It is of grace. It is of victory that is guaranteed by the hand of God. It is little surprise that Psalm 119 that David wrote is the, the longest chapter in the Bible, and in it we see just how much David savors the word. He's not a seeking the word in a kind of technical, legal, cold, mechanical, just this kind of what does the word say? What is my, my duty before God? He is coming to the word and he's finding in it truth and promises and goodness and gloriousness to savor that, that his heart is rejoicing. If you have your Bible and you wanted to flip over to Psalm 119, you would see just the extent to which David's heart savored the promises and the word and the, the commands of God. Psalm 119 and, for example, verse 103. Psalm 119 and verse 103. Now, if you are here this morning and you have a sweet tooth, which many of us have, you're going to be impressed with this verse. David says, how sweet are thy words unto my taste, yea, sweeter than honey to my mouth. David is saying, God, I would rather meditate on your word than eat a bar of chocolate. When, when we eat a bar of chocolate, we, we, we delight in the, the taste of it and we enjoy it. But David is saying, when I meditate on, on the words, it, 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 it infuses my heart and my soul with, with delight. David said, I would rather meditate. Your word is more tasteful to me. It, 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 it is more enjoyable to me than a bar of chocolate. Look at what he puts, how he puts it. In verse 72, the law of thy mouth is better unto me than thousands of gold and silver. David is saying, I would rather have an open Bible to put it in our language before me and be studying and meditating and delighting in the word of God than to get my bank balance and, and to see that, that my bank account was really healthy. I mean, it's nice if, if God enables people to have a, a, a nice bank balance. But David said, listen, I, I would rather open the word than look at a healthy bank balance. Look at how he puts it uh, finally here in verse 111. Thy testimonies have I taken as my heritage forever. They are the rejoicing of my heart. So here David is an example for us again. He's not just seeking the word. He is savoring the word. He's waiting in the word. He says, God, you've given me a hard word and, and, and some of my men are afraid. God, 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 can I dig a little deeper into this? And God says, here is, you're digging a little deeper and, and in, the, in, in the hardness of the command, I will show the glory of a promise that you can savor, that you can meditate on, that you can rejoice in, that whenever you go to Keilah, you'll be going and you'll be obeying, but the enablement and the grace and the strength and the victory, that will come from me. So David is an example here of what it looks like to savor the word. And finally, we could say that while David seeks and savors, he ultimately submits to the word. He submits to the word. Not saying, God, what would you have me do with Keilah? Like, like in a theoretical sense, God, what would it be a good idea for, for a person maybe to, to do with Keilah? And, 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 and let, let's think about this. No, no, David's saying, God, what, what do you want me to do with Keilah? 
God, I'm seeking a word for you, for me, and when you give it, I'm going to savor it, but I'm going to submit. And David goes to Keilah, and in the walking and in the path of obedience, he finds the grace and the strength and the victory, for he delivers Keilah out of the hand of the Philistines, as we see there in verse 5. David knows that he can only taste the joy of this grace. He can only taste the strength of this victory as he walks in the path of submission to what the word of God actually says to him. And consequently, I think you would agree that in this chapter, David comes across as the person he describes in Psalm 1 that meditates on the word, and therefore he's like a tree planted by the rivers of living water. This chapter is not easy. David is still in the wilderness. It's still cat and mouse, and yet there is a strength to David here. There is a composure. There is a stature. There is a grace. And you say, David, where do you get that from? And the answer is, David's roots are wrapped around the word. David is savoring the word and he's drawing life and he's drawing strength. In fact, he says in Psalm 119, 45, I will walk at liberty for I seek thy precepts. David finds liberty in the path of humility and obedience. David finds joy. David finds victory by submitting to the word of God. I think this is an amazingly encouraging chapter to all of us who who know and love the Lord here this morning. I don't know if you still have those moments in seeking the word where you realize kind of, uh uh-oh, this is a hard word and and obedience, kind of the implications wash over you and, 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 and then the more you study, then you find the promises of the grace and of the Spirit's help and of the Spirit's enablement and as you walk in that grace, it is then that you get to enjoy the, the strength and the grace and the victory that God gives. If that's one half of the dominant thought of this passage, we could say, to put it like this, that there is a greater half, and that is that while David is repeatedly seeking, the big, brilliant, encouraging truth in this passage is that God delights to reveal and illuminate his word to a seeking, savoring, and submitted heart. When you, child of God, come to the word and you want to know, God, how should I think about this? God, how should I navigate this? God, how should I get through this? This, promise, this, this passage comes with, with, with the example of David, yes, but, but the even greater encouragement that where there is a seeking heart, God speaks. Psalm 25 and verse 14, David says, the secret of the Lord is with them that fear them. Or we could say, God confides in those that fear him. God delights to speak to a seeking, savoring, submitted heart. God promises wisdom and guidance to a seeking, savoring, submitted heart. Every time David seeks in this passage, God speaks. In fact, verse 6 is really what we might say is the centerpiece of this section. In the way it's written and laid out, it's clear that this is the heart, really, of the part that we have read. Look at what it says there in verse 6. It said, It came to pass when Abiathar, the son of Ahimelech, fled to David, that he came down with an ephod in his hand. Here is David seeking. Here is David savoring. Here is David submitted to the word. And what does God bring to him at this moment? He brings the ephod. It was a part of the high priest's uniform. It had to do with seeking the mind of God. It was an apron that rested over the high priest's shoulders. It had a pouch in which there was the urim and the thummim. These were, we think, stones, and through them, people could seek a word from God. If they had a yes or no answer, they could ask, and the Urim and Thum would either give no answer, or it would give a yes answer, or it would give a no. And so here is David, right at this moment, with a heart that is seeking and savoring and submitted, and God delights to speak. God delights to bring the ephod right at this moment. Child of God, 
David stands here as an example and an encouragement to our hearts this morning. Is, is there something you're seeking the mind of God and, and you're, 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 you're maybe thinking, I'm at the hard part right now, honestly. I mean, I, I've got the part that I am to obey on and, and the implications are washing over me. Keep seeking and you'll see the promises that there is grace and there is victory and there is strength and, and you enjoy that as you walk in the path of obedience. God has spoken, we might say, through creation. We see how good and glorious he is. God has spoken far more clearly and, and explicitly in his word that is inspired. And the, digger, the, the deeper we dig, the more good and glorious he is. And God has spoken through the word incarnate. And when we gaze upon the cross, we are seeing how good and glorious our God is and how good and glorious his word is. And it is something that we can savor more than a bar of chocolate. It is something that we can submit to and as we submit to the commands we find the grace of the promises pouring in and we find enjoying our walk with God. Can I ask you child of God whatever you're negotiating with at your moment how should I think about this or how should I think about that? Is your heart seeking answers in the word? Is there a savoring of the word? Is there a submission to the word? That is how to become like this tree that, that, that even in dark times, it, it, or in dry times, it doesn't leave its, lose its leaves. It, it is strong and stable because it's rooted in infallible, inerrant, God-inspired truth. David's a wonderful example. If David is an example to be followed, Saul is an example of warning. He stands as an awfully stark contrast of the dangers of a cavalier attitude to the word. David is an example to encourage and inspire, but Saul is an example to warn. David is an example of somebody walking in faith with the Spirit of God upon him, and Saul is an example of a cold heart, and and the Spirit has left him in his role as king. Saul didn't truly seek God's word. When Saul had scenarios rather like Keilah here, do you know how Saul made his decisions? He was moved by personal preference. He was moved and swayed by the opinions of others. He was hindered in his fear of others. We we don't find Saul with, with, with an open Bible, as it were, and an open heart seeking. In chapter 13, the Philistines invaded Israel with an incredible show of might. Israel was facing a crisis. Saul was told that if he went to Gilgal, Samuel the prophet promised a word from God. The word of God was as available and accessible to Saul as it was to David. But while Saul went to Gilgal, there is no evidence of him truly waiting upon God. He fell back on his own understanding. And while Saul could say, listen, technically I waited and technically I saw it, his heart wasn't waiting for a word from God. Maybe somebody we could picture reading their Bible. I'm reading the Bible, they say, but but, but Saul's heart was not open. And we see even there that, that God waited and waited and waited, seeing how close Saul's heart was. Saul, God delights to speak to an open heart, but here Saul wasn't really listening. In chapter 14, Saul again starts to seek a word from God, and this time it's through the priest who is carrying the ephod. However, when the priest has his hand, it seems, in the pouch, Saul says, withdraw thine hand. Saul said, well, I started to seek the word, but but I grew impatient and I fell back on my own understanding. We don't get the impression of Saul savoring the word. If you bumped into Saul on a given day, he would have been savoring his own opinion. Well, what you're thinking about this, well, he could have given you a, 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 a mighty tide of, of his own opinions and his own thinking, but he wasn't savoring the word. Saul could have savored the opinions of others, and and he did, but but we could find him quoting the word and engaging in discussion with Samuel about the word, but we never think of Saul writing a Psalm 119. His heart wasn't warmed or melted 
by the word and therefore he never submitted. We find whenever he was commanded in chapter 15 to destroy the Amalekites, he didn't utterly destroy them as the word had said. There wasn't this submission to the word. His concern with was what are others doing or what are others thinking? And Samuel had to say to him to obey is better than sacrifice. Rebellion is as the sin of witchcraft. Here is Saul who stands as an example and a warning of what it is to treat the word of God with a cavalier and a careless attitude. What were the results in Saul's life? They were painful. If David becomes like a tree, Saul becomes like a piece of chaff driven about all over the place. His heart and mind were not tethered to the word. They were not rooted in the word. And therefore, when winds of opinion swayed and changed, Saul wasn't like David who remained unmovably and unshakably grounded in the word. Saul becomes like a piece of chaff that is carried about with the wind. In the previous chapter, we saw how he was imagining that his men were conspiring against him as if they had a secret plot to undermine him. There was no such thing in reality. This was a figment of Saul's imagination and his mind has become this place of shifting shadows as he is blown about with whatever his imagination comes up with. If we do not root our thinking and our living in the word, then it's not that we will just sit there like a stone. It is that that in being not tethered to the word, whatever wind comes and blows, it can carry us away. Even more concerning is that during all of this time, Saul was deceived. Look at what he says in verse number seven. It was told Saul that David was come to Keilah, and Saul said, God has delivered him into mine hand. Listen to Saul's language here. God has delivered David into mine hand, for he is shut in by entering into a town that has gates and bars. Honestly, if you bumped into Saul at this particular moment, do you know what he would have the audacity to tell you? He would have the audacity to tell you that he'd had a sign from God that God was in favor of his actions and that God was delivering the Lord's anointed into his hand. How deceived has Saul become? He believes that God is in favor of what he's doing and that, that God is working and he's had a sign of God's favor even though Saul is completely deceived. How did this happen? Here's how it happened. When he failed to seek the word of God, and to root his life in the words. His mind became a playground for his imagination, and he was driven all over the place like a piece of chaff. This was James's concern in the New Testament, that there would be people amongst the church, they were familiar with the word, they could use the language of the word, they could use the terminology of the word, they were hearers of the word, they could discuss the word but they weren't doers of the word and Paul saw James says they were deceiving their own selves the evidence of faith James says the evidence of love the evidence of relationship is that we come to the word and we seek the word of our king and we savor the word of our king and we submit to the word of our king not only was Saul deceived, but most sadly of all, most sadly of all, if it's true that God speaks to an open, seeking, savoring, submitted heart, it is also true that God can fall silent to a heart that is closed. It's not without, it's not a coincidence that in this passage with Saul, with all of his Believing his own ideas and concerns about the opinions of others. He slays the priests that were in this town of Nob. He drives the ephod away from himself. And it comes into the hands of a man who is seeking the word of God. And by the end of his life, when Saul is faced with the Philistine enemy again, Samuel has died 
And Saul seems to want a word from God. He seems to want a word from God. But Samuel is dead. And he consults a medium. And here is what Saul says. He says, I am sore distressed. But God answereth me no more. Neither by prophets nor by dreams. The danger of a carelessness with the word. The danger with a cavalier attitude to the word. The danger with falling back on our own understanding is here displayed in Saul who gets to a moment where he wants a word but God has fell silent. This morning we have a beautiful example in David what it means to look like at a heart that has been changed by grace. The evidence of that grace is that there is God. I've got a predicament and God, honestly, my opinion isn't the issue here and others' opinions is not the issue here and why aren't other? that's not the issue. God, my heart's concern is speak to me through your word. I want to know what you say and, and what you say, I've just realized it's hard. God, can you continue to speak and to illuminate and, and God, I've now got a promise that, that there's grace for me to walk in the path of obedience and as I walk in the path of obedience, I'll know your favor and I'll know your joy. I want to submit. Where we find a cavalier attitude as with Saul, it is a concerning evidence of a lack of grace within the heart. And and the lack of being rooted and grounded in the word is that the mind then becomes vulnerable to be blown about all over the place. Saul or David is an encouragement to you, child of God, this morning, an example to be studied and to be followed. God speaks to a seeking people. He has given us his inspired word. He has given us the word incarnate. It shows that that he is good and glorious. He loves you. He died for you. He can be trusted. And even the hard words, there is grace and strength to obey. And there is grace and forgiveness when we have failed. But Saul stands as a warning. If light has been shined on your path and God has been speaking, don't harden your heart in case the omnipotent and eternal God would fall silent. Let's pray. Dear Father, thank you for your word this morning. We pray, we pray, we pray that in these days that we live, you would find us a people with an open Bible and an open heart. We, Father, thank you that David could say he found your word better than a bar of chocolate. Your heart, your word rejoiced his heart. He walked in liberty and in freedom as he walked in obedience. He became like a tree planted, Father. That's what we want to be. We want to be like a tree that is unmovable and unshakable and the the winds of change do not change us. We pray that you would grant us, Father, grace to see the beauty of this example and we pray, Father, you would grant us eyes to see the warning of Saul who rather than waiting for a word fell back on his own understanding. He was within seconds of getting a word, but he fell back on his own understanding. Father, we pray that you would grant us grace this morning. If anyone has come up against a hard moment of obedience, we pray that they would see the encouragement of David, that where a command is given, there is grace and enablement in the gospel for them to walk in joyful obedience. Grant us your help, we pray. In Jesus' name we ask it. Amen.